I'm pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Alexander Cohen to our seminar this week. Um, he said he's very happy to answer questions during his talk. So if at any point you have one, please enter them into the textbook or raise your hands and, and he'll address them during um, or save them till the end. So Alex is an instructor of neurology here at Children's, uh, specializing in translational neuroimaging approaches to understand and develop treatments for neurodevelopmental disorders. He earned his BA, MD, and PhD from Washington U in St. Louis, and then did his child neurology training at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, when Alex joined Children's in 2016 as a pediatric behavioral neurology fellow, he did his postdoc at the computational radiology lab here and at the labo laboratory for brain network imaging and modulation at Beth Israel. So now, as he says, he sees patients in the autism spectrum a center and behavioral neurology clinic and is building a neuroimaging lab focusing on identifying the causal neuroanatomy of symptoms in autism that could serve as treatment targets for non-invasive stimulation. And here he's uh, presenting his talk. Can I take it away, Alex? Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you all for the invitation to come and talk with you. Um, I, I look forward to kind of working with Everyone, as we move forward too, I think we have a lot of shared interests and there's a lot of uh, potential for, for moving uh, the whole field forward. Um, I'll start by activating PowerPoint. Um, I have no disclosures, of course. Um, it'd be nice if I did, of course, but we don't. Um, I wanted to start with just briefly um, a little mention of who, who I am uh, because um, you kind of, I know we already just had that introduction, but I also want to work with a lot, many of you in the future. And I think it's kind of always nice to know where people come from as well. Um, so, um, even before uh, my, my training, I was an army brat. So I've lived all over the country as well as in South Korea for a while. And there's my siblings. Um, I spent 12 years at WashU in St. Louis. I did get, um, three degrees there, which is very monotonous. Um, but it's a really fun place. And, I, um, and as you can say, I did my medical training when I had shorter hair and a short white coat. Um, I also did a lot of research and a corner desk with lots of screens. And you'll see that's a recurring theme for me. Um, and that's where I did, I spent a good four or five years doing a lot of neuroimaging research. I went to Rochester um, in um, upper Midwest to do my pediatrics and child neurology training. And it's an amazing place, but it's very cold uh, for much of the year, uh, but don't let that um, uh, uh, shy you away if you ever get an opportunity to visit there. It's almost a, a Disney world for medicine in a way. Um, but it is very, very cold and I can't emphasize that enough. And this was even just at the airport, it was literally zero degrees. Um, and I had to like warm up the engines to get it to start on a regular basis. Uh, but it's very interesting. You get to see interesting patients. Uh, you get to have interesting colleagues like the eagle that lives on the top of Mayo Clinic. Um, and they have a camera in their nest. And so you can see the eagles on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then I came here to Boston Children. I've been here now four years. I originally came as a behavioral neurology fellow, uh, learning about autism and other behavioral disorders in pediatrics. Uh, I was lucky enough to have one of the first uh, T32 um, uh, postdoc fellowship spots for the a uh, new program under Mustafa Sahin and Chuck Nelson for translational uh, neurodevelopmental research. Um, and now I'm an instructor in neurology. I, I now have K funding and some foundation funding as well to get things started. Uh, and as you can see, I still sit in the corner desk with multiple screens over in the Longwood Center. Um, however, we'll be moving over to two Brookline Place once the building is finished. Um, the M new MRI machine is getting installed uh, next month uh, and then we'll be up and running probably this winter. So what do I do? Um, very briefly, I use functional connectivity to study the brain. Um, I um, have, this is a method that I've been using for quite some time. I was in, became in, engaged in this back in, in graduate school um, and recognized very quickly that this would have a lot of utility for pediatrics and development. Um, but functional connectivity as its core, and I wanna make sure that this is, that we all have a solid understanding of this because a lot of the methods get complicated fast and the more you understand the basics of this, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, so functional connectivity basically asks the question, are these two regions part of the same network? Now you can use that with structural connectivity and ask what is the integrity of the white matter tracks, the axons between two regions? But you can also ask that from a functional standpoint by asking how similar do these two regions act? And so if you take two regions like left and right angular gyrus and you look at their just spontaneous time course in the MRI machine with a, with a, a bold sequence on, 
over five minutes, you find that the time course of two those two different spots are actually very, very similar. Um, and it's, this is not by sheer chance. Uh, we think that there's a lot of connectivity that goes on between these two regions that may not even be single synapse, but could be multi-synaptic. Uh, but regardless, activity in one region seems to be echoed in other regions. And the level to which you see that correlation corresponds with how close they are in the overall brain connectome. And you can use this phenomenon for many different things. Um, and under, in graduate school, I, I actually use this to define functional areas in the brain by looking at where these patterns are consistent and where they change rapidly. And that seems to be a very robust finding. Uh, you can use this to study the formation of functional networks over development. And here you can see in red the default mode network as it gains integrity through adolescence, actually, and into a, the young adulthood. And you can actually even use this to do a lot of what's now been called fingerprint analysis. And we did an early version of this now close to 10 years ago, looking at, at um, can you predict someone's age based on their pattern of, a pattern of connections across the brain? You can do a pretty good job, as you can see here, age versus a maturational index we came up with. So now, now that I'm at Children's and now that I'm you know, setting out my career, what I really want to do is, is try and use functional connectivity and other methods to try and ask, where do autism symptoms come from? And there are many different autism symptoms. I'm very interested in the where question uh, because we, while we have some medications for some symptoms, they're very blunt instruments and it'd be really interesting and, and beneficial if we could directly treat uh, symptoms in a, a targeted way, kind of neuromodulation, TMS, DBS, TCDS, fMRI-based neurofeedback. There's lots of different methodologies that are being developed or already in place and FDA approved. And if we just knew where and when and how much to stimulate or suppress activity, perhaps we could treat things with mental side effects, which would be really nice. So there are many different autism symptoms, as I said, and there's a lot of heterogeneity. This ranges from the core features of social communication deficits and repetitive and restrictive behaviors, which are part of the DSM-5 criteria. But there's many other symptoms that any clinician will tell you are very, very common, and they're not part of the diagnostic criteria. We just call them comorbidities or other symptoms you can see. And if you're a lumper or a splitter, you might say, oh, this is all the autism or, oh no, these are all separate conditions. But these are the things, the kind of things you can see. And there's a very common expression that if you've met one person with autism, you've just met one person with autism. There's a lot, because of the level of heterogeneity and the different uh, symptom patterns in each individual, it's very hard to study one small group of autism and, and use that to inform, to inform decisions or information about the general giant population of autism. There's, there's just a lot of variation and finding group level effects is actually very different, uh, very difficult. But regardless of the fact that there's all this heterogeneity, symptoms are symptoms. Anxiety is anxiety, repetitive behaviors are repetitive behaviors. Um, you know, difficulty with attention is difficulty with attention. And so we think that, and what the consensus seems to be forming over the past decade or two is that specific symptoms across diagnoses, across clinical diagnoses, actually appear to be consistently related to specific brain regions. And this makes a lot of sense. If you want to, if you have a motor symptom, motor networks have to be involved in some way, shape, shape or form. And we see that that seems to be hold true through cognition and personality as well. And, and, and this is supported by the NIMH's uh, recent push for the RDOC, the Research Domains Criteria, where they're trying to align research and align our knowledge along these kind of, um, along a matrix where you have in one direction symptom categories and in another axis you have levels of analysis. And really trying to align things based on symptoms, not by diagnoses. So what's interesting is that many of these autism symptoms can actually be seen in other clinical cohorts. So perhaps we can translate not from the bench to the clinic, but from one clinic to another um, and use some of this, use some similar tools. In fact, and where I'm going to start, where this starts to get you know, more concrete is that many of these symptoms can actually be caused by brain lesions, which is very fascinating because then you have the causal information of you have no symptom, you have a brain lesion, and now you have symptom. And so the causal information or the causal inference from that is much stronger than you get from PET studies or fMRI where this group of subjects has increased activity to one spot and they have this symptom. Well, it's like, well, is that causation? Is that compensation? Is that a biomarker? Is it the effect of having something else going wrong? You don't really know without some sort of modulation or intervention. 
So why is having a lesion symptom relationship so important? Well, classically, particularly in neurology, but in all of neurosciences, you can look across a group of patients who all have the same symptom and ask, where do these lesions tend to pile up on top of each other? And when you do this, you find that um, for many cases, these lesions all overlap for one part of the lesion. And perhaps you can even say, ah, injury to that spot must be necessary and sufficient to cause the symptom. Therefore, this is the critical substrate. This is where that symptom or where that cognitive process must lie. Unfortunately, for many of the symptoms that we're thinking about, a little more complex um, or require you know, much more of the brain to be involved, you don't find the same phenomenon that you have patients with almost identical symptoms have lesions in very different parts of the brain. And so the localization is unclear. There's not, they're not all hitting the same spot in the brain. Well, Mike Fox and Aaron Bowes over at Beth Israel a couple of years ago had the really interesting idea of what if we look at lesion locations through the lens of functional connectivity. If you take a map of normal functional connectivity and healthy controls and ask, do all of these lesions hit the same, function, the same functional network it turns out they do, and you can use this functional connectivity for this. You can actually use structural connectivity for this as well. They both work. Um, and, and this has been called like indirect connectivity or a lesion network mapping, or there's been lots of names to this, but there's a growing cottage industry trying to localize symptoms to specific networks now using lesion information. And so the first project that I worked on here uh, was basically the idea of using lesion network mapping to ask the question, why do individuals with autism demonstrate atypical face processing? Um, and I'll get to why that's so interesting and why that's the first one we tried. So I'll start by saying patients with autism do demonstrate atypical face processing. Not all of them, but, and it's variable depending on the task and the particular study, but very commonly you'll see differences in visual search patterns when you present faces. Uh, you'll find different performance on an inverted face task. Uh, particularly if you ask someone to recognize faces or, at, or give them questions about like, are the lips upside down or correct um, for a face that's upright versus inverted upside down, typically developing individuals um, will usually respond much quicker when faces are upright than when they're upside down. And that's because we're used to looking at faces upside, uh, we're look, used to looking at faces right side up. And so we have a holistic um, trained brain module, if you will, or brain function that is faster at that. Uh, but looking at brains upside down, it is a much more conscious effort. We have to specifically look at the features and compare against a, um, compare against what we're doing, and it, it takes it's a slower process. Uh, individuals with, with autism perform similarly both of these tasks um, as evidence, perhaps, that they do not have that holistic face interpretation function working as well. So these abnormalities, kind of face processing difficulties, or even now some electrophysiologic signatures of this, like the M170, are some of the earliest detectable potential signs of autism. And this is starting to get validity as potential biomarkers. And these, these are studies underway to see if that actually pans out. But the neuroanatomical basis of why they have this is still relatively unknown. We have lots of theories, but we don't know for sure. But we do know a lot about phase processing from PET studies, from fMRI studies, from even just psychological reaction time studies and from, more, and from animal studies as well. We know that there seem to be separable functions, both in just identifying faces, period, in different orientations, taking that information and, and, and passing that off to parts of the brain that are stored, that have our memory about other faces, um, identity of others, name retrieval, bringing that up to cognition, and separately understanding the expressions and the emotions that are in the faces using face information to understand speech better, oops, and, um, and also to get gaze cue information, understand where someone is looking. And that in particular is something that's very difficult for children with autism to do. We also know that there's many regions that are involved in face processing that seem to have particular sensitivity to face stimuli versus other stimuli. Um, importantly, the lateral fusiform gyrus or the fusiform face area, the FFA, uh, made famous by, by a, a Nancy Kenwisher's group here in Boston, but also the occipital uh, uh, face area, the OFA, posterior supratemporal sulcus, and many other regions as well. And this extends in the further out you go into the rest of the brain. But when you look at the literature of what's been done in children or adults with autism from a neuroimaging standpoint, all of these regions have been found to be abnormal, but not all at the same time and not in the same study. So there's been some studies that said, oh, the FFA is abnormal. 
Other studies will say, no, the FFA is normal. It's actually the frontal cortex. Other studies will say, no, 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 it's not the frontal cortex, it's the amygdala. And so it's been very difficult to understand what's going on. Part of that's from the heterogeneity of the population. Part of it's the differences in tasks that, that they're doing. And parts of it is just perhaps, you know, some of these effects may be, just like we said, effect, not cause. And so it's really hard to tease us apart, tease us apart by just studying children with autism. Fortunately or unfortunately, um, there's another patient population with very strong difficulties in face recognition, and that's folks that have had strokes and then develop acquired prosopagnosia or face blindness. They have very severe face processing deficits. They have typically intact other processes, um, but a lot, a lot of times they'll have object agnosia as well, but sometimes not. And we can ask the question, can they provide some insight into another population like autism that also has abnormal face processing. And so the way that this works is you go about and you identify all the case reports or everything you can find in the literature where they describe a case of clear and, um, and obvious face processing errors after a brain injury or acquired prosopagnosia. And there's enough information to, to trace out the lesion or you can get the actual 3D neuroimaging data from the, from the authors, from a collaborator. And so I was able to find 44 cases in the literature. Um, these cases are rare, um, but when they come up, they often hit case reports. As you can imagine, doing a case report of this now would not be possible because it'd be like, yeah, we've, we know that. And so a lot of this literature is older and the imaging, the actual imaging files are not available anymore. Um, and when you take all these images and you put them together, it turns out that a good fraction of them actually overlap the fusiform face area, which is what you'd expect to see. And if you look on Wikipedia, that's what it's going to say, that acquired prosopagnosia requires injury to the FFA. And, and textbooks will say that too. And they say sometimes it's bilateral, but you've, this is where you've got to be. But 15 out of the, about a quarter of the, of the patients had lesions that were not including the FFA. They were distanced. Sometimes you could say, oh, well, these are other members of the known face network from the fMRI data, but sometimes not. And it, sometimes it doesn't make any sense. And as you mentioned, these are perhaps overrepresented in the case, case report literature, but that's still interesting about why do these patients have uh, acquired prosopagnosia. And so then you can take these and not just overlap the lesion locations, but you can do lesion network mapping of prosopagnosia. So I'll walk you through this slide. So on the left, you have our lesions that uh, one through 44, and you can take each lesion location and pass that through a functional connectivity database. So not functional connectivity in that particular subject, because lots of these subjects are you know, from the 80s or from the 90s, and we just have CT scans from them. But you can use a normative functional connectivity database and ask, what would this lesion have hit? You know, what, what was this region connected to before they had a stroke? And that's what you're seeing here. That's what these functional connectivity maps represent. Now, if you do something simple, like you threshold these maps and just look at the strong positive and negative correlations, and then you overlap them, you find that they all coalesce in, at the right FFA. So even though only two thirds of these lesions actually hit the FFA, they're all connected to the FFA. And that seems to be very important. It's very sensitive at 100%. In fact, if you just take the, the 15 lesions that did not include the FFA at all, that they were distanced from the FFA, those are still 100% connected to the FFA. You can also do ask the statistical question. Actually, before I even get to that, um, one surprising thing was it wasn't just positive connectivity to the FFA that was important. All these regions, all these different stroke locations that cause prosopagnosia were 100% positively correlated with the FFA, but also 100% negatively correlated with some specific frontal regions. And I'll come back to come back to what this might represent, but this was very interesting. So it's not that not just that lesions had to be in parts of the brain that are connected to the FFA. They had to be in regions of the brain that were connected to the FFA and connected to these left frontal regions. And that's a circular argument for the moment, but we'll come back to that. You can also ask things statistically and say, well, what if you compare prosopagnosia strokes versus strokes that are just you know randomly acquired from a tertiary care center, um, and you get a very similar pattern. Um, and if you compare strokes that cause prosopagnosia versus strokes that cause other syndromes, you also get a very statistical, statistically strong map that says that this pattern of connectivity uh, and these, the locations of lesions that cause prosopagnosia is actually pretty sensitive and specific. So when you, when you take these, I'm sorry, when you take these analyses and you do an intersection of these, 
and you ask the question, what is specific and sensitive, you get a couple of very specific regions. So all, all lesions that cause prosopagnosia and to a statistically significant degree, um, you know, compared to lesions that do not cause prosopagnosia, you can basically say that lesions that are positively, or lesions that lie in the network that is positively correlated with the FFA and negatively correlated with these four left frontal regions are the ones that you would expect to cause prosopagnosia. So perhaps these represent critical nodes for impaired phase processing. And that's pretty exciting because while it's hard to hit the FFA with the TMS coil, these frontal regions are right on the surface. And this isn't even all that far from where we would stimulate for, for depression at DLPFC. So perhaps we need to increase activity there. Perhaps we need to decrease activity there to boost phase processing. But that's, that's the hypothesis that's being generated from this data. And it's also important to recognize that this approach gives you different information that you get from traditional task activation studies. Here you can see a collection of regions that come out of, a, a, out of like a face meta-analysis. You have the fusiform face areas left and right, the occipital face areas left and right, superior temporal sulcus, the amygdala and the right inferior frontal gyrus. All these regions have face selective activity in fMRI studies. But it turns out that the lesions, the strokes that cause prosopagnosia or impaired face sensitivity are not typically connected to these other regions. They're pretty much connected to the fusiform face area and the right more than the left, but there's a lot of um, a, a strong functional connectivity to homologous regions. So it's, it's unclear whether you actually need the left or is this just a consequence of using functional connectivity. Furthermore, these left frontal regions that I mentioned are not just random regions. It turns out that this is actually the left frontal parietal control network. And control networks in the brain um, can be divided into the frontal parietal control network and the singular opercular control network. The, the singular opercular control network seems to have maintenance signals, but when you have to do a task set, you stick someone in a scanner and have them do a complex task, these, these areas will be always active and with a spike right at the beginning of the, of the block. The frontal parietal control network, on the other hand, will have a spike when you first start activity, but will also be actively modulated based on a trial on a trial to trial basis. So this is kind of like your online active perception of what's going on, comparison to error from the cerebellum, constantly making adjustments, things like that. So it's kind of like your online active cognitive control network. And that's what you're seeing here. So furthermore, you can ask the question, like you, now that you have these two separate findings, you know, positive connectivity to the FFA and negative connectivity to these frontal regions, can you actually predict face processing ability in another population? Well, sticking with lesion data for the moment, um, you could ask the question, you know, if um, you have the connectivity of the FFA and the frontal, frontal uh, parietal control network, what parts of the brain would you expect to have a lesion there? Um, and that's what you're seeing here. The red regions represent regions that are positively connected with the FFA. The blue are regions that are just negatively connected with those four left frontal regions. And the purple is the intersection of the two. So I would expect lesions that cause prosopagnosia to lie in these regions and not elsewhere, and vice versa for lesions that don't cause prosopagnosia. Well, I was able to identify a data set in France and get the data from a collaborator there of 31 patients who had posterior cerebral artery strokes, but were perfectly fine. They had no clinical deficits. And he brought them back and did very careful psychological testing with those 31 subjects and, and, asked, and tested them on all sorts of different object agnosias and face agnosia. He, he measured their ability to recognize faces, houses, cars, horses, telephones, all sorts of things to see what he could find. And it turns out that at a subclinical level, he could differentiate these patients based on different levels of agnosia to different categories. And when I got the stroke information from him, the lesion locations, it turns out that the patients who had subclinical facial agnosia had strokes that hit these specific predicted regions or this, so this specific predicted network that's both positively connected with the FFA and negatively connected with the left frontal cortex. And, and patients that did not have any detectable facial agnosia, subclinical or not, had lesions that actually just spared those regions, even if they had object agnosias to other categories. So this is really interesting. So we can predict stroke-related findings, but now is the question of, can we, predict, um, can we predict face processing ability in autism, which is not a lesion-based disorder? 
And um, based on these findings and, and, and proposing a project that sounds just like that, that's what my K23 that uh, just got started a couple months ago is going to look at. And so we're going to bring in teenagers uh, with and without autism across a wide variety of face processing ability, which we'll measure before we stick them in the scanner. We're going to measure autism severity, we'll measure face processing, we'll measure um, IQ and some other, other metrics as well. And then we're going to put them in the scanner and get functional connectivity and task related activity uh, while, while looking at faces and some movies and some other things. We're, and we're going to uh, see if functional connectivity of these particular regions or task activity in these particular regions predicts face processing ability more so than you'd expect and in a way that is perhaps autism specific or not. And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of years from a prospective standpoint. So I'm going to pivot there and I'm going to talk about another topic um, that is an, another application for lesion network mapping and functional connectivity um, that's very near and dear to pediatric neurology um, and particularly here at Children's. And this is a project that um, basically Jurian tracked me down and said, hey, I know you're using these new methods. Um, we should really apply it to this question. And this is the question of do children with tuber sclerosis complex, um, like why do some children with tuber sclerosis complex develop infantile spasms and not others? And this is very interesting from a lesion network perspective because kids with tuber sclerosis complex have tubers in their brain. That's where the name comes from. So I'll walk you through a little bit of this too. So TSC, as I'll call it for the rest of this talk, is a genetic disorder. It's rare, it's autosomal dominant, um, and it hits multiple organs in the body, including the brain. And we know the genetics of it. And here you can see some of the tubers of where it gets its name. And they're kind of um, slightly vague on imaging, but you can find these pretty uh, consistently. And they also have cardiac hamartomas in addition to these cortical hamartomas. And so TSC now gets diagnosed often prenatally based on the ultrasound. And so you can track these kids pretty fast and enroll them in studies, even though it's quite rare. These children are at very high risk for developing autism, um, potentially due to these tubers, but there's also abnormalities at the synapse in even areas that don't have tubers, so it's a little bit unclear. Um, and the vast majority of them have epilepsy, including a very particular epilepsy syndrome called infantile spasms, which I'll talk about some more. And many of them have developmental delay as well, of course. So infantile spasms is a very severe phenotype, a very severe um, epileptic syndrome. It's sudden in onset usually occurs in the second half of the first year of life, so like eight, nine, 10 months old, sometimes later in the second year of life, third year of life, but usually um, around that age range. And when this happens, all of a sudden you have developmental arrest, even regression. Um, you, if you get infantile spasms and it's not treated, it's very, it portends very poorly for your developmental outcomes. Um, but it's actually exquisitely sensitive to particular anti-epileptic drugs. You can either use high-dose steroids like ACTH, or a medicine called Vigabatrin or Sabrol, uh, which is a GABA agent. And treating with, with Vigabatrin actually um, is very, very um, effective uh, in the vast majority of cases. And just to show you what this looks like and why this is important, here you can see a child with infantile spasms and it's very subtle, it's just a slight jerk. And you can imagine that, and there he goes again. And you can imagine that that could very easily be mistaken for reflux or just an exaggerated startle response. And, and that's all they have. They don't have, and they don't often have classic seizures yet. And those often comes later. So this can go on for quite some time before it's recognized. And, and our goal is to try and get these recognized, referred, um, confirmed and start treatment as fast as we can. Like within a week would be great. I think uh, on average, this usually goes on for multiple weeks, if not a month or two before it's recognized correctly. Um, so the goal, one of the big goals in neurology is to bring it down that response time because we have a treatment. Um, the pathophysiology of spasms are still not well understood. We know it's associated with hip arrhythmia, which is continuous high amplitude activity. And then when they have the spasm, the activity quiets down um, and pauses, and then it kicks back in after the spasm stops. It's very unusual. Um, and, and so to study this, uh, we're part of the TASERN network, the, ASC, the TSC Autism Centers of Excellence Research Network that includes Cincinnati, Children's, Boston, Alabama, Houston, and LA, UCLA. And this was work that was done in Simon Warfield's lab, but also with Jerry and Peters as well, of course. 
And um, from the Tasserin data set, we had 168 patients total. Um, and after filtering this down a fair bit, we found 123 that we could use for further analysis for our question. 74 of them had spasms, 49 of them did not have spasms. Um, there's an increased rate of TSC1 um, in that population, and that's to be expected. TSC1 typically has a slightly more uh, se uh, severe phenotype. And you can see the average age at infantile spasms onset was right around five or six months old. And what we did with the help of Brekia, who was a visiting medical student from the Netherlands, is we went through and traced or segmented all of the, all of the cortical tubers in all 123 patients. And this required some automated machine learning algorithms with a manual correction and, and quality assurance by Brekia. And what you can see is that in patients with and without infantile spasms, there are patients with high tuber burdens and patients with low tuber burdens. So by eye, you can't look at any given patient and, and, and say they're gonna have spasms or not. Um, on average, you can say the ones that have more tubers are more likely, but that's about it. Well, you can ask this at the voxel-wise level now that we have all of these tracings and we and if you just look at where these things overlap you don't it seems to cover most of the brain there's not a particular pattern you can statistically ask are any particular voxel locations the pre, um, more associated with spasms than not and you can only explain about 24 percent of the variance or 24 percent probability and that's not very good if you just look at overall tuber burden percent of cortex affected you can see that tuber burden is highly correlated with with infantile spasms in blue that's not surprising, this has been reported before. But there's been many reports with smaller cohorts saying, oh, it's this lobe or that lobe, and that didn't really seem to pan out. Um, there's a slight you know, uh, sparing of the occipital lobe maybe, but not really. Um, however, if you do the lesion network mapping of infantile spasms, just like before, you take all the tuber locations, you generate functional connectivity maps from all of those, you threshold them to just look at the strong positive and negative correlations, and you overlap them, you really only get two regions, the bilateral globus pallidus and the cerebellar vermis as having negative correlation with the tuber, with the cortical tuber locations. If you split your data in half, it still works. You get the exact same regions. And if you do a statistical comparison, like a two sample t-test at the voxelized level between spasms yes and spasms no, you get the same regions as well. So it's not just a sensitive, but it's actually specific for infantile spasms. Now, we already know that tuber burden is predictive of, of uh, infantile spasms, but what about connectivity of the globus pallidus or cerebral vermis? Well, you can ask that question. You can generate a model basically trying to predict infantile spasms based on these three variables. Um, you can just do it once in a descriptive standpoint, or you can build a model based on 80% of your data and then test with 20% of your data. And because we have uh, different sized groups uh, for spasms versus not. You have to use something along the lines of a repeated stratified k-fold cross-validation, which took me a little while to figure out um, how this is supposed to be used, but um, this works actually very well at allowing you to test the consistency, not the generalizability, because it's one data set, but the consistency of your finding and to confirm that it's not being driven by any particular subgroup. Um, and you can repeat this thousands of times to get, you know, kind of a, a measure, like kind of like a leave one out approach, a similar, similar approach. So when you do this, what you actually find is that cerebellar vermis connectivity drops out. It's not predictive. And really the fact that it comes out of the analysis seems more related to the fact that uh, the cerebellar vermis is correlated with the globus pallidus, but there's some noise in here. But really it's that globus pallidus connectivity is, is uh, predictive of infantile spasms and tuber burden is too, but cerebellar vermis doesn't seem to add any information. And that's something you can get out of doing a multivariate logistic regression or a multivariate linear regression. Furthermore, when you do this repeated cross-validation approach and you get your predictions for po your positive and negative predictions for the remaining 20%, you can build a receiver operator curve, a receiver operator characteristics curve, an ROC curve. And you can see that the area under the curve is about 0.73, which is not bad. I think this is pretty, cons uh, from what I recall, this is pretty consistent or slightly better than what you'd see with using like a white blood cell count to predict infection. Um, and so, and we use that all the time. And so um, this is getting there, um, but this still needs a whole separate data set to really see if this generalizes as well. And you can also look at the logistic regressions and look at the, the predictors for each variable. And it turns out that globus pallidus connectivity is much more predictive than tuber burden. 
In fact, when you build a model that has both of these, it's the globus pallidus that sucks up the, the variance and the tuber burden that actually becomes non-significant. So what this tells me in my interpretation of this family of models is that tuber burden is predictive because the more tubers you have, the more likely you are to have tubers that are negatively correlated with the globus pallidus. And it's not just that the tubers have to hit, you know, specific location, have to hit, you know, all the brain anyway. Um, it, but is that this is why the increased tuber burden is correlated, which I thought was uh, really interesting. So what does all this mean? And how does this fit with what we know about infantile spasms? Well, this might help explain why some children develop spasms versus others. Um, maybe some tubers that impact this particular network are more spasmogenic, or this network is more spasmogenic. Um, it's not clear why. Probably some sort of relation to globus pallidus. We know that globus pallidus and the cerebral vermis are both important in, in, in inhibitory regulation. They both use GABAergic transmission as their outflow. And vigabatrin, or sabral, that medicine's very exquisitely useful for infantile spasms, is a GABA transaminase inhibitor. And in fact, in some children where you give gabatrin, they come back and um, they get MRIs because of altered mental status or just as a follow-up of their, of their tubers. And you find that they actually have cytotoxic edema at this particular spot in the globus pallidus, um, which is really interesting from a converging evidence standpoint. So that's where I've got, that's what I've done so far over the past, you know, kind of uh, one or two years kind of starting to develop my own research program. Those are the first two things we've looked at. Those are the first two papers. We're now starting to work towards um, um, work looking at other symptoms as well as trying to start validating this approach. Um, as I mentioned, I've, I've already looked at prosopagnosia or face processing, and now we're taking that into a prospective validation study. Um, we've looked at infantile spasms with the TSC population, and we're actually going to try and use the same population of children with TSC to see if, if tubers also predict face processing ability in those same kids. Because if that's true, perhaps tuber location can help us predict a lot of other things. And that's very useful because um, there are, you know, this is, these are children. And many, many times strokes in children don't cause as much of a phenotype as they do in adults. And so it's, it's difficult to obtain causal information from young children. Um, Fred Schaefer and Mike Fox's lab has also been looking at epilepsy writ large from lots of different sources. Um, Jaya, who was working with Mike Fox, also had looked at depression as well, which is common in autism. And that's uh, a very complete story that used a lot of data. We're also starting to look at data sets that have strokes or other brain injury where they've measured social skills, theory of mind, affect perception, other measures after their injury um, and, and see if we can find some correlation there or some consistency there. And we also have data from Hong Kong actually with uh, post-stroke um, agitation or aggression scores. And that will be very fascinating to see if we can localize irrit irritability or agitation because that's something that's very um, seriously impairing in children with autism and is often what, la what lands them in the emergency room and in the medical field, which is not good. Um, so the next steps for us moving forward is basically threefold. Uh, one is to continue to generate circus-based hypotheses. And again, a lot of this approach is hypothesis generation, not hypothesis testing it. The testing requires validation in the, in the patient population you're interested in, or go straight to an interventional trial with TMS or something else. Um, and that uses specific symptoms with, from cohorts with lesions, tubers, tumor resections, et cetera. If you have a cohort with uh, brain injury or other um, causal information at your stimulation sites or anything else, let me know. I'd love to collaborate and see what we can figure out. Um, then moving forward, validating these localization, localizations through prospective neuroimaging study or other methods with children with ASD or other neurodevelopmental disorders with similar symptoms. And that's what I'm starting to build up right now. Uh, we have funding to do this with the TSC population for face processing as well as um, NIMH K23 to do this in autism for face processing. And then finally, what I'd like to do moving forward is actually test whether modulation of these identified circuits with things like behavioral approaches, fMRI-based neurofeedback, or TMS-based interventions actually modify the symptom of interest. And if that is true, now you've got your clinical trial. You're, we're actually moving towards actually getting this back into the patients. Um, and so if you're already running trials on anything similar, you can actually compare stimulation sites or the efficacy between stimulation sites using these methods as well. And that's a very 
valid way to use kind of lesion network mapping or just coordinate network mapping as well. Um, I also have a side project, which I think is very interesting too. Um, one of the critiques for doing this is what are you using as your map of normative functional connectivity? And typically that represents adults and just uh, functional connectivity data from young adults. So I'm building a developmental, I call it a developmental atlas of brain connectivity, but that sounds very, you know, highfalutin, if you will. Um, but really what I want to do is collect all of the available functional connectivity data um, that's out there. And I've already identified over 20,000 subjects worth of data, ranging from three years old up into adulthood. And there's more, you know, about to be released from the, the baby human connection project, the developing human connection project um, for even younger as well. And try and get these into a consistent format process in a consistent fashion um, so that you can analyze questions using all of this data, not just in each specific data set separately. Um, there's a lot of harmonization um, issues with that as well, but um, I think the biggest thing is getting all the data into a consistent uh, uh, format and processing first. And so I'm working with Research Computing uh, to do that on the cluster here. Um, and we've already started um, just with one data set with the ABCD, um, the adolescent data set starts with nine-year-olds. Um, we're just about complete building a nine-year-old connectome. Uh, which is a static one shot in time, but it's a start. And then we can start comparing nine year olds versus adult data. And then we can start adding in all this other data that we already have access to. And finally, I'll, um, I'll just point out that this work is tremendously collaborative. Um, everything I've presented to you so far is on data that I did not collect myself. And that's a, almost a requisite of this kind of approach is that if you spend all of your time collecting the data, you're not going to have any time and resources to analyze the data. Um, and it requires a lot of work with a lot of different people. Um, you can see the folks that I work with in my own lab um, in, in, um, as we're getting started. I also work with many other folks in the neurology department here in the CRL under Simon Warfield. Um, also Chuck Nelson over in the LCN developmental medicine. Um, has been very, is, is becoming very critical to my work moving forwards. Um, and also, I'm a very close collaborator and friend of, of Mike Fox, who was at Beth Israel before, and he's now just starting a new Center for Brain Circuit Therapeutics over at Brigham. And um, he and I work very closely together on the development of these methods and the application, both in adult and pediatric conditions. So with that, I will stop and again say thank you for inviting me, and I'd be happy to discuss any part of this or answer any questions that any of you have. Thank you, Alex, that was fantastic. Uh, does anyone have any questions? No. Hi, I actually have a question. Thank you for your talk, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm Xiao, and uh, so you talked about the prosopagnosia, and uh, I'm wondering that the uh, you may know about the other race effect and uh, how will you comment about the, the difference between the other race effect and the prosopagnosia and how will they reflect in the in the in the in the fMRI the, the results? Um, it, it cut out there for a second. Can you say specifically what the what the effect was? You're you're wondering about. Uh, uh, Different from from prosopagnosia, the the other race effect that uh, we may see, we may not be able to recognize the face of the other race very efficiently. That if uh, we are not in the same race, the, this is oh, I see. Incorrect uh, question. Yeah, so that's so that so I would I would frame that in um, in you know kind of. Identity recognition, face recognition too. There are many subclassifications for prosopagnosia um, that we did not go into um, for for that study for looking at that. Um, uh, one of our collaborators and one of the co-authors on the patient on the uh, on the uh, paper, Jason Barton, is very interested in this, where you have um, uh, prosopagnosia where you can recognize faces but not who it is, versus not being able to recognize it as a face at all. Um, and it's, it's very interesting, you know, where that might fall out. Now, as far as our general, you know, how we've each tuned our face, our face recognition ability, and you're absolutely right that there's, that we are better able or quicker to recognize or differentiate faces that are more, um, more similar to ours or that we're exposed to. 
Um, this is this. I think this represents more of a general rule of brain um, function, um, in that, like, if you think about language use, you know, we were we're able to discriminate the phonemes in our base language and our native language much more so than in other languages, and and that differs. And I think the the different the people's ability to differentiate faces based on different particular features, um, I think, is in part innate, but also in part learned. Um, and I think that's part of what drives that, that other race effect. Um, but um, it's, a good, it's a good question. I don't know exactly where that would fall in this network or what would be particularly critical that you'd have to, uh, if there were, if there were uh, patients where they had small strokes that particularly uh, broke their ability to recognize other faces that are um, or stimulation information or other other um, causal information of, you know, where, like, you know, of patients that lost that particular part of face processing ability. That's the kind of data that would be needed to kind of answer it with this approach, at least. Um, or you, one thing we've also started doing is even just taking the coordinates from fMRI-based analyses. So fMRI-based meta-analyses or the collection of studies that have looked at particular processes and found particular you know, localizations, but they don't line up in the meta-analysis, you can take all of those and say, oh, actually, they don't align at, in one spot, but they're all studying the same network, just with different paradigms, and that's why they're different, getting different activities. So there may be questions to get at that using what's been found from fMRI so far. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I have a very short question. Hello, I'm George. Uh, thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, actually, it was very, very interesting. Um, I have a question regarding the possible therapeutic, uh, hmm, actually, yeah, the therapeutic possibilities of your research. So why you realize that probably most of your research has to do with localization and targeting specific areas, which might uh, reveal some very, very useful targets for neuromodulation. But uh, at the same time, I, I'm sure you know a lot about this, but autism might be uh, a neurotransmitter disease. So there are many different uh, kinds of uh, autism and probably a lot of different uh, pathologies behind it. Yeah. So what do you think that uh, would be a good connection between the functional connectivity studies mm -hmm. and a therapeutic uh, perspective of your research? Yeah, and, uh, this, and this is a very important question too. And it comes down to, you know, one thing I'll actually even talk with patients about is that in all of medicine, and this includes, you know, all of our translational research as well, we try and understand for any particular patient, you know, what is the correct diagnosis? What category do they fall into? What is the cause of that diagnosis? What's the ideology, whether it's a genetic um, a mutation, a neurotransmitter imbalance, whether it's a, a le you know, an anatomical lesion, like cerebellar stroke that caused their autism, things like that. Um, and then finally, and then on the other end of the spectrum, what's the treatment? What are we gonna do about yeah. it? And for many things in medicine, you know, I, understanding the cause has led to specific treatments, but at other times, you know, understanding the cause was kind of completely unrelated to what the treatment ended up being, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and so this is where, um, you know, the levels of analysis and the cause versus the symptoms really starts to differentiate. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily um, as, you know, worried or concerned about the specific cause of someone's autism. Whatever, you know, there's over a hundred different genes, almost 200 different genes now, probably more than that now, um, that can yeah. increase your rate of autism also, yeah. we also know that there's other environmental, you know, risk factors too, like being born very premature, things like that. But regardless of the path of how they ended up on this developmental trajectory, they end up with, with somewhat similar symptoms, you mm -hmm. know? And if you think about the, the levels of analysis or the levels of, of just kind of neuroscientific organization, you have behavior, organism, and then you have systems, you have brain networks, and then your brain regions, right. and then columns, blah, 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 all the way down to individual neurotransmitters. So even if the actual deficit is low in that totem pole, it's like at the neurotransmitter level or the, or the genetic level, in order to get expressed as behavior, it's gonna to have to go through all those different levels. Mm -hmm. So even if we're not addressing the root cause, perhaps we can treat some of the symptoms. 
and the and the shallowest level of intervention actually the shallowest level of intervention is just behavioral therapy and we know that that works so yeah. if you go one step below that and treat and try and treat brain networks that's where i'm hoping that this might work and so the the level of translation um is is nice because it, it's the most directly related to behavior because like for instance like that like i was get, saying at the beginning if you have a problem with vision it's you've got to involve your visual networks somewhere you know if you have a motor problem you've got to involve the motor networks somewhere and and that's why a lot of like the dbs targets and the tms targets we have many of them are more motor related so like tremor you know central tremor parkinson's yeah. and things like that because we understand those networks much more and these more cognitive or personality or emotion networks are a little bit more difficult to you know difficult to understand like we still don't entirely understand why tms to left dlpfc is useful for depression you know is it because those regions are negatively correlated with orbital frontal emotion regions or something else we don't really know um and and so that's that's where i think that these two interplay is that what we're looking for here is not um not going to be specific or necessarily specific for specific causes um but we'll be focused at the symptom level at symptom management and symptom treatment yeah go, go. yeah thank you thank you yeah. any other questions Okay, I have one. Um, so this is, this is really interesting and I like George's this question because um, I work in connectomics. So we're used to thinking of things as being all interconnected and, and your work is very targeted. And what I struggle with is how to translate looking at things globally into something that's translational, which is what you're doing. And in autism, this is particularly interesting because of the abide data set. Um, it's become, I mean, we all know that um, functionally there's a hierarchy in the system and, and people are showing that it's not just specific primary sensory networks that are affected. It's the interplay between them and things like the default mode network and questions about the DMN when you think about that, you think about its negative correlations, and then you've mentioned negative correlations quite a few times, and it's not often you hear of people targeting these areas for treatment. So I feel like there's something that has to bring all these together, but I struggle with connecting whole brain connectomics type of analysis yeah. and investigation with what you're doing. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. And and so I would and and so something I always talk about with with folks when they're getting started with with any sort of connectomics, whether it's structural or functional, is is exactly as you're saying. The brain is a single network. You know, we use the term network, like the attention network, the default mode network, but those are just local neighborhoods inside of the overall network of the brain. The brain is a single network, and you may have to take multiple jumps to get to, to different spots, but it's 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 one brain and and so what we end up doing is we we focus on specific parts that you can tease apart to more or less degree to try and understand the roles that those those sub networks have in different function and and so i don't see as large of a divide i see that you know you can think of it as all as you have the whole brain you have the whole brain network and you're effectively in this kind of you know, hypothetical, you're injecting current, you know, you're injecting signal or modulation into particular points in that network. And they're going to have more effects locally in that network space than they are distant in the network space. And since different parts of the network are more or less involved in different tasks, behaviors, personality phenotypes, that's where you'd expect to see the behavior and see the effect. Um, now there's a lot of overlap and many symptoms serve double duty. And so that what, that's where things start to get complicated and, and thinking about just a single modulations point, point may be in, ineffective. And maybe what you need to do is you need to kind of, you know, touch the brain at different locations within that same network to increase the coherence of different parts of the overall brain network or decrease the coherence of different parts of the brain network. So there's many ways that in, in which this goes and, we're we're just you know hitting the tip of the iceberg as it were um with with taking this approach of just looking at what's the most correlated with this 
but you get out full-fledged maps that include the whole brain as having more or less relationship with any behavioral phenotype. It's just, we're just focusing on the, air, the specific areas that have the strongest relationship and what parts of the overall brain connectome those are involved in. But there's definitely more to, there's definitely more to explore here. There's, there's yeah. a lot of data, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think it, in, I tend to go things around the other way. It might not be so obvious that maybe it's the roundabout ways that are equally as interesting as the direct connections because everything is connected to everything else. And it's, it's, it's the non-direct connections that I'm intrigued by. Um, and you, and you, could, you could very much imagine that any of these kind of methods might say, oh, well, there's this one spot in the brain that seems to be critically important for this, but it's not a possible target for modulation unless it's or like you know, something where you'd need DBS to go after it. But really that one spot is also connected to all these other regions on the surface. And perhaps if we use TMS or something else and we modulate all of these other regions at a much lower level and just kind of tweak things, you have an additive effect on the region you're interested in, kind of sneaking in the back door, it's kind of the roundabout approach like your method, you know, like you're you're proposing. I think that's a very real possibility. Um, and that's going to be, that's going to end up being, you know, probably a decade from now or two decades from now, as we start doing like, you know, compared efficacy trials for TMS, we're still working on, you know, do you, you know, is there in improved benefit? Is there increased benefit from stimulating multiple sites versus single sites, you know, for depression and for things that we've already been doing for a while. Um, but perhaps uh, explorations like this could actually add some hypothesis to the trial and error that's already underway. That was my next question actually, is it common for TMS? I don't know anything about it to stimulate different regions at the same time. Uh, not very much. You know, it's, it's something that's been explored. A couple of the companies, uh, one company in particular has a very large array and um, basically you're almost stimulating half the head. Um, but there's been a lot of question of, um, of can multiple can can multiple simultaneous stimulation um, affect the efficacy, or even if the efficacy when you're stimulating at one site, you know there was a question of you know where exactly should that site be, even for depression, and is it that you want to hit that same site exactly every single time, or whenever they come back it gets to slightly a slightly different location, you know we're still in the ballpark of of you know accurate measurement of where we're stimulating and how that compares to efficacy. So it's, it's still very early, but I think the more, um, the more converging evidence you have, the more informed the thought process can be about where do you stimulate, how much do you stimulate, do you stimulate multiple sites at once? You know, I, th I, th I think that's what I want to do because there's already TMS studies out there for autism. Um, there's a group in California that had emailed me and I talked with them last year. They're like, yeah, we're going ahead and we're doing a TMS study for agitation. And I'm like, well, where are you stimulating? Is it, like, oh, we're going to stimulate, you know, here because it has negative connectivity to inferior orbital frontal. Um, uh, and I'm like, well, is there a reason to suspect that would work? It's like, well, but we think, you know, that's emotion related. You know, it's very, you know, not, you know, there's not a, there's not a specific study that they can point at and say, yes, we know that impactment of this circuit works. It's purely trial and error, and that's already going on. And I think the more we can add actual hypothesis testing to that, I think it'll only accelerate things and hopefully, you know, not poison the well for people. You know, all these TMS trials not working. You know, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to be had there. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Actually, I have one question. Yep. Um, that was a beautiful talk. I'm trying to see where I am. Um, actually, I have two questions. So first question um, is kind of related to a TMS treatment. Um, like, I understand the concept of trying to hit the specific region or part of the brain. Um, and applying that to autism, which is not a lesion, uh, it's actually a developmental disorder. Um, do you think there might be consequences in terms of um, causing unwanted symptoms if you hit the specific region? Um, brain does reorganize a lot during the development, so we're not sure if particular region plays a particular role in developmental disorders. No, absolutely. 
I'm really oversimplifying things here. <laughs> no, but I, I, I know where you're going with this too, because it's, it, this is something I've thought a lot about as well and something I've had to justify in grant applications also. Um, but I, you know, I, and I completely agree, you know, autism is not a lesional disorder. It's a developmental disorder. You know, I, I see patients, I diagnose kids with autism, you know, on a unfortunately weekly basis. And I do not recommend getting an MRI because there's no reason to. The brain looks normal. And, but my hope is that, you um, know, that there may be, there may be functional connectivity evidence or, you know, fMRI, or there may be evidence that modulation of specific networks may help specific symptoms. So obviously it's got to cross the threshold of benefits outweighing the risks. So, right. What like when I was back in Switzerland, we used like a uh, diffusion tensor and like connectomics. Mm -hmm. So one of the results of our research was, well, in prematurely brain, um, prematurely born infants, the, the, there is a lot of reorganization. You get uh, strengthening of the associative fibers mm -hmm. and weakening of projection ones. Yeah. Um, and that can actually lead to reorganization of the brain who's not where looks different, but they actually a child functions normally so that was the but i guess you kind of tackled that a little bit at the end of your talk or, mm. where you said i'm trying to collect developmental um my other question was about the globus pallidus mm -hmm. you mentioned that as a finding but you didn't specify which part which kind of oh yes it's it's interesting <laughs> it's um i it looks like it's globus pallidus interna but the actual spot is right on the, is almost on the line between interna and externa. Okay. And so I've, you know, and I, and in the, I'm, we've already written that up as a paper. It's, we got it back from reviews at Annals of Neurology um, that they want us to do a couple extra things and it'll, it'll, hopefully it'll go back and get accepted. But I, in that I even put, you know, we think that this is Globus Pallus interna. That is where you also see the Vigabatrin um, cytotoxic edema findings as well. Mm -hmm. um, but very often those findings, you know, are hard to distinguish because because uh, they're not entirely centered on GPI. They mm -hmm. kind of extend up and we're seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's further internal um, anatomical stratification there where things closer to the boundary is what we're looking at, or if it's just the neuroanatomical blurring, you know, kind of this is, a, this is the resolution of where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, but it does, I, I, and I've stared at this a lot with Jurian as well, and we're both kind of opinion that, that GPI probably makes more sense yes. from visibly what we're seeing and from a function standpoint. But yeah, it's, I, I didn't really, yeah, I don't really lean on that too strongly and say that it has to be GPI. I'm not 100% sure. And it, was there any attempt to try to, you said the burden of TBS, uh, the, like, um, mm -hmm. uh, burden of, uh, of the tubers. Uh, tubers, uh, that that plays a role. Did you try to kind of stratify like tubers that might be related to basal ganglia? Because not all cortex actually is linked to basal ganglia. Right. It does project project by like widely, but not all of them go there actually. Right. No, and I, I think that's actually the basis of what we're finding. Mm -hmm. Um is that um is that when you look at the like just look with the structural connectivity, if you look at the the functional connectivity you know, it, I, I think what we're seeing is that the tubers that cause spasms more or more preferentially affect the cortex that does have projections to and from GPI or uh, from the gold palatus. And I think that's actually what this is saying. Um, and, and, and that's why there's a negative push. That, that's why there's a negative connectivity signature for those. Um, so it's, it's very, it's, it's very interesting. And I'm, and you know, I would love to be able to like just to stick an electrode in GPI during a spasm and see what's going on. But it's, uh, which maybe, you know, that's something we're also looking at as far as like, you know, getting access to some of the, um, the, the, the surgical studies and things like that. Um, but it's, it's I, th I think that's exactly, the, that's exactly the premise of what we're seeing, the underlying finding, um, is that those are the regions where if you have tubers in those locations, you're more likely to have spasms than not. Nice work. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll have to wrap up there. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, I'm sure Alex will be happy to uh, be contacted by email. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Alex. That was really, really interesting. Oh, thank you. And, and uh, again, thank you all for the invitation. And I, I look forward to talking with you all soon. All right. Take care. Yeah.